Hello, I'm Dan Baroni, Chief Operating Officer at American Solutions in Washington, D.C. And we're pleased to share with you Newt Gingrich's discussion with former RNC Chairman and Bob McDonald's Campaign Chairman, Ed Gillespie. During this conversation, Gillespie talks about the lessons candidates running in 2010 should learn from the McDonald campaign and so much more. This is a part of the Solutions Academy ongoing series about running for office. Please learn more at americansolutions.com. Now we hope you enjoy the conversation between Newt Gingrich and Ed Gillespie. For American Solutions in Washington, D.C., I'm Dan Veroni, and thank you for listening. As, as you saw the campaign unfold, when do you think the strategy, first of all, describe what you think the strategy was, and then tell us when you think it began. Well, the strategy was to run as a proven problem solver with a record of bipartisan accomplishment, and Bob McDonnell uh, is... Uh, all of that, and then to uh, hone in on the issue most important to the voters of Virginia, which is the economy and jobs. And it was encapsulated probably best with the bumper sticker, Bob's for Jobs. <laughs> and that uh, was the prism through which we filtered pretty much everything, whether it was transportation policy or education policy or energy policy. It all tied back to how that would help improve quality of life for the people of Virginia and create jobs uh, here. And then we reinforced uh, Governor McDonald's record as Attorney General and in the uh, General Assembly at passing bills that uh, attracted not only Republicans but Democrats as well. And, and voters are looking uh, for that, I think especially true in an executive uh, in the governorship. Uh, they want somebody who can solve problems and fix things and get things done. Uh, that's not to say he was not a principled conservative. He ran on uh, a, a very vigorous policy agenda that was uh, rooted in conservative principles, uh, but the emphasis from the outset was uh, proven problem solver with a record of bipartisan accomplishment. Do you think it mattered from your perspective in terms of the way you just described that strategy, who the Democrats nominated? Not really. Um, I think that at the uh, initially my, my fear was that who they nominated – would match up a little bit against that, that we wouldn't get enough contrast in that regard because uh, the uh, Democrat who emerged from the three-way primary was actually uh, the most centrist of the three, at least in terms of perception, and was someone who uh, came from out west, uh, who, uh, a district bordering West Virginia who had a record when it came to, uh, for example, Second Amendment rights that was at odds with his, uh, his party, uh, who had a reputation as being more pro-business than, than many in his party. Uh, but he really didn't know what he was for, and he wasn't able to, you know, to crowd us, uh, crowd McDonald in that space uh, because he didn't have a, a proactive policy agenda. Uh, really, when you, when you boil down his rationale for candidacy, it was, uh, I want to be governor. <laughs> I think I've seen some of those campaigns. Right. Uh, you know, you, a couple of things you all did that was, uh, I think, a little bit different. One was you had learned, uh, it seemed to me, a great deal from uh, the Obama campaign on the use of new media. How would you characterize um, the McDonald campaign and its new media relationship? Well, completely adaptive and uh, uh, conscientiously or, or uh, I would say explicitly modeled on the Obama campaign uh, as best we could. That, that by the end of the election, Bob McDonald's campaign was in direct contact with 250,000 people, and there were less than 2 million voters on Election Day. Now, not all 250,000 of those uh, folks were Virginians, but I would say probably 200 to 220,000 were. So uh, 1 in 10 of the voters on Election Day were hearing directly throughout the campaign from Governor McDonald or his surrogates, uh, either through text messages or emails or Facebook postings uh, or YouTube videos or uh, teleconference uh, calls. And uh, so when troubles uh, came, which they always do in, in a uh, campaign, in the course of a campaign, we had an infrastructure that was able to sustain McDonald, despite what the Washington Post might be saying or uh, one of the local television stations or a liberal daily editorial page would be saying. People were getting direct information with facts, data-driven information and quotes from, from McDonald directly that they could forward to their friends or use at the water cooler or, or 
uh, after uh, church on Wednesday night or Sunday morning or, or after synagogue or after the soccer game. And that really sustained us at times, in, in particular uh, during the, uh, the thesis story that the, that the Washington Post uh, really kind of harped on for, for a good uh, three- to four-week run there. The, um, with your use of the new media, did that feed at all into the effort you made for uh, youth outreach? It was a big part of youth outreach. Uh, uh, younger voters get their information through, uh, you know, the text messages and, and YouTube videos. We had a very creative use of videos, by the way, and we worked uh, very closely with the Republican Party of Virginia, which which did a great job in using uh, funny, uh, uh, real-time videos of our opponent to define him. Uh, they they had, uh, in fact, they were the first to really run the the clip of him uh, just utterly unable to respond to the question of would he or would he not raise taxes uh, in November if he were elected governor. And uh, that went viral. And uh, I hadn't seen, frankly, on our side, on the Republican side, I hadn't really seen a viral video take off like that one did. Uh, uh, I'm sure there are other campaigns that, that have, but that's the first time I saw one. And it was because we had an infrastructure there. We had a plan that, that centered on on new media and on the need to, to especially get to those younger voters uh, in a creative uh, way, and and I would say too, not just uh, the, the, right next to that is the, to the new media is a creative way to get to non-traditionally Republican voters, and I, I tend to put younger voters in that same category, which is why I thought of it. But you, you know, we also did uh, we had 31 different bumper stickers uh, and largely coalitions, so veterans for McDonald and sportsmen for McDonald, but also uh, Korean Americans for McDonald and Vietnamese Americans for McDonald and uh, Hispanic Americans for McDonald in different languages, and, and made clear to uh, to voters who aren't uh, accustomed to Republicans campaigning in their neighborhoods or in their communities uh, that they were welcome in the McDonald campaign, and we wanted their vote. Now, what, that really raises, uh, I think, a couple of issues. One was somebody said you you printed brochures and yard signs and things in at least four languages. That's correct. Um, do you think that was helpful? It was immensely helpful, and and it's not so much the uh, that if you're Korean American and you see the the McDonald for Governor sign in Korean, uh, uh, most Korean Americans we know are assimilated very well, and uh, although they have distinct communities, uh, uh, they would just as you know they could just easily read the McDonald for Governor sign in English. Uh, but it was it was more the message that uh, we're trying to reach you, and you're important to us. Uh, and we want your vote, and we're going to campaign in your community, and Bob McDonald is going to come uh, to your event and uh, and wants to be a part of it, and, and you are welcome here. Uh, and the same with the Latino voters. We've had a history in Virginia in the last couple of election cycles uh, of, of conveying messages that uh, did not make Latino voters feel welcome. And we have a, a big uh, a community here in northern Virginia in particular uh, with uh, Guatemalan, Honduran, Salvadoran, uh, Nicaraguan American voters, uh, who, in terms of their economics and their values, uh, and and their view in terms of uh, security, uh, by all rights should be our voters. But we've not made that clear to them uh, over the past couple of cycles. And we did that. The same, I would say, is true of African American voters as well. Bob McDonald made a very vigorous uh, outreach effort to uh, African American voters, and uh, that really paid off at the end of the day. Well, that part of what I want to go back over this for another second is because, again, there's a sense among some people that it's very hard to be a conservative, and clearly Bob McDonald is a solid conservative, and appeal both to young people and to minorities. And yet you managed, I mean, we have proof in the voting pattern, uh, you managed to be a, an attractive, appealing conservative with both those communities. Well, I think part of it uh, was uh, the external environment, particularly with younger voters. I think a lot of them uh, who were voters for uh, President Obama uh, in, in uh, 2008, well, frankly, a lot of them didn't, didn't turn out in 2009, a lot of those voters. Uh, but a lot of younger voters who did turn out and who had voted for him had, been, had become disenchanted with him, uh, very concerned, I would say, over uh, the impact of debt on their future. Uh, so that gave us an opportunity. They were they were open to McDonald's message, but the medium uh, or the media by which we communicate communicated with them helped to get them. Uh, and then, in terms of the uh, the Latino voters, uh, in particular, and Asian American voters, 
the truth is our message resonates very strongly in those communities. The conservative principles are, con- are principles that they share, strong families, entrepreneurship, uh, communities of faith, and, and uh, you know, frankly, a very strong sense of patriotism. My father, uh, an immigrant, came to this country from Ireland at the age of nine. Uh, and I always say, you know, he was he was born in, Jack, Jack Gillespie was born in Donegal, Ireland, but he died a, a great American. He fought for his country, and he instilled that in his children. And that's true whether you're uh, first-generation Irish uh, or first-generation uh, Guatemalan or, or Mexican or uh, Vietnamese, I think. And so uh, uh, the, the conservative principles resonate very strongly. It's a matter of, of taking them into the community. Let me ask along along the same line. Um, you you all were able to carry Northern Virginia in a way. I mean, I think you carried Fairfax County for the first time. I'm guessing in a generation, yeah. uh, which is one out of every seven voters. What what was there about this campaign that broke out of the pattern that the the uh, Virginia GOP had gotten itself into? of sort of not being present in Northern Virginia? Well, for one thing, we uh, had an outdated uh, model in terms of our uh, strategy. Uh, the, for, for the past three cycles I saw statewide, and uh, I, did, I also served as chairman of the Republican Party of Virginia, so I, I saw this and I was very involved in George Allen's uh, Senate campaign. Traditionally, the Republican mentality had been, uh, we'll cede Northern Virginia and we'll run up our margins downstate. Uh, But the numbers had just grown so big in Northern Virginia, you couldn't, that didn't work anymore. Uh, And you have to campaign and compete in uh, Northern Virginia uh, in order to win statewide. You can't just cede it any longer. And this was the first campaign uh, since I've been involved in uh, Virginia politics and really since I've lived here where there was a vigorous effort to get Northern Virginia voters and and to compete in Fairfax County. The truth is, we didn't count on winning Fairfax County. That was not in our in our formula. Uh, thrilled when we did, but uh, we worked it very hard just to, to hold the margins down. Um, but one of the ways that Bob did that, first of all, we emphasized the fact that he's from here. He grew up in uh, Fairfax County, uh, went to high school at uh, Bishop uh, Ireton, played against the the Titans uh, from the from movie fame. Remember the Titans? <laughs> um, and we emphasized that, and all the yard signs said Fairfax's own. Uh, Bob McDonald for governor, and uh, but secondly, just in terms of tone, I mean, he he ran an inclusive campaign. Those those voters in uh, Northern Virginia who, uh, you know, in terms of the issues, are with us on uh, taxes and uh, economic growth and health care, really, and and energy to a large extent. Uh, they're with us on the issues, but they they are more comfortable supporting a candidate who they see campaigning for the African-American vote and for the Hispanic vote and for the Asian-American vote. So there was a, you know, a, a, he conveyed, a, conveyed an image of inclusiveness from his campaign that gave greater comfort to those uh, more moderate-leaning suburban voters and those independents in Northern Virginia. Uh, one of the things you also did as a consequence of the way you campaigned, it seemed to me, was uh, you carried legislative seats in a way that increases his ability to govern. W- was that a conscious strategy? It was a conscious strategy. Uh, the McDonald campaign worked hand in glove with Speaker Howell and, and his caucus and the uh, Republican Party of Virginia. Uh, and, and we, at the end, were doing very well uh, financially in terms of uh, contributions. People saw the McDonald campaign as something they wanted to be a part of. Uh, and, and all across the country, money started to come in happily. And we were in a position to help, uh, to help some others. So, so McDonald uh, did not hoard his, his resources. He he helped his uh, ticket mates down ballot in the uh, LG race and the AG race in particular, uh, and he he helped uh, candidates around the state for the House of Delegates. And I would say, Speaker, not only was that important in terms of uh, did that help in terms of governing to pick up those six uh, seats, which which will be a real and is a real uh, asset to him as governor to have six more uh, uh, of his own party in the House of Delegates, but because he ran on a vigorous policy agenda. He gave those candidates something to run on also. And so they were running on the same things he was running on. We're not going to allow card check in Virginia. We want to have offshore uh, energy exploration uh, here in Virginia. We want energy to be the, we want Virginia to be the energy capital uh, of the eastern seaboard. And we want to make sure that we're creating jobs by holding down taxes, not imposing new costs on small businesses. So not only did they, did we help them win by, by our, uh, the way we, tactically went about the
spending decisions in the campaign in the ground game, uh, and, and that'll help us govern. But they all ran on his agenda because he had a, a positive policy agenda that was detailed and, and specific that they embraced. Now, along that line also, one of the things that I thought was most interesting was you picked up on energy, both from the offshore drilling aspect along the coast and in terms of coal inland. Can you comment a minute on, on the role that energy played as part of your job's description? Well, it was huge, especially because uh, in the, the national environment, which was a was an asset to uh, Governor McDonald as well, uh, although we made sure to point out that this race is about Virginia, um, uh, but the national environment helped uh, him in terms of the, the policies, and particularly cap and trade or cap and tax. A new energy tax uh, was not going to help the people of Virginia, uh, which, you know, we've got more coal in the southwest here. Uh, it, it, it's like, uh, you know, West Virginia or southwest Ohio, south, southwest Virginia is, is one of the part, uh, the richest coal veins in the, in the country. Uh, and then we have uh, energy offshore, and we, we want to be the first state to allow on the eastern uh, east coast to have uh, drilling offshore uh, where, you, where it's the, the rigs are out of sight in environmentally safe uh, exploration, uh, and those rigs may be out of sight, but the jobs won't be. It would have a big impact on well-paying jobs in Ham- the Hampton Roads part of the state, as well as a big impact on revenue to our to our uh, state treasury, which has a four billion dollar deficit right now, um, and, and it would bring down the cost of energy. So it was a three for. And yet, uh, here was the federal government trying to raise the cost of energy per household and kill jobs in a policy that uh, our opponent had embraced. He had embraced cap and trade as a member of, uh, of Governor Kane's uh, Energy Advisory uh, Commission, and, and that was a, a position he tried to uh, slip away from, but we wouldn't let him. Uh, and so the voters knew uh, that, uh, you know, when you, when you scratch beneath the surface, Cree Deeds was someone who was inclined to raise the cost of their energy and, and cost jobs in Virginia, and Bob McDonald was going to lower the cost of energy, create jobs, uh, and help fill the, the uh, coffers in Richmond. Well, what would you say was the role of the uh, Republican Governors Association in this whole campaign? Critical. I mean, they were a, uh, a partner in this effort from the outset. Uh, they, uh, they were there early and often, and uh, in fact, uh, people don't realize this uh, because you know you always look back on a campaign and you see the the happiest parts uh, when you had a win. Uh, but Bob McDonald was uh, losing to Cree Deeds after the primary, the Democratic primary concluded in June. He was he was uh, upside down in two public polls and he was upside down in our own polls internally, and uh, uh, that was partly the result, but not entirely, uh, largely the result of the earned media that Deeds got by kind of coming from behind and surprising in his uh, in his victory in the Democratic primary. But it's also reflected the fact that the uh, the labor unions and outside groups had spent three point three million dollars on negative ads attacking Bob McDonald before Memorial Day. And, and uh, you know, we had taken on some water there. We had, uh, you know, been able to fight it back because of the RGA, the Republican Governors Association, sustained us in that, in that, through that spring offensive and sustained the McDonald campaign so that we were able to focus on raising the resources for the fall and not get distracted into a, uh, uh, you know, into a fight with a proxy group. We let, you know, the... The RGA is a proxy at, uh, you know, fight the the, uh, the Democrats proxy group, and that was hugely uh, hugely helpful. In fact, uh, I, I don't know that if uh, I think we could have won at the end of the day uh, without uh, that. I suspect, but I, I, it wouldn't have been 19 points. That's for sure. <laughs> was was the campaign shaken um, by Deets getting ahead and by Deets being the the least ideological of the candidates, or had you already taken that into account and factored about where you'd be at that stage? No, we uh, we weren't shaking. We were a little surprised, like everyone. Um, uh, although you could kind of see it coming, and and uh, but he did. He you know the Washington Post kind of carried him across the finish line at the end, and uh, uh, so we weren't. We were prepared to run against one of the other candidates and have a more uh, crystalline uh, ideological contest, uh, uh, conservative versus liberal, uh, which still is an effective contest in Virginia. Uh, Democrats have succeeded here, uh, frankly, over the past uh, four cycles. And Democrats have won back-to-back governorships and back-to-back Senate seats by blurring the ideological distinction uh, between conservative and liberal. Uh, so we thought we were going to be in a, in a clear ideological uh, contest. Uh, that wasn't the case, uh, uh, and that made, the, uh, I think, the, the contrast in 
who's a more effective leader uh, important, and who can who has the ideas to uh, carry Virginia forward into the future. And again, that gets back to the importance of the policy uh, uh, aspect of the McDonald campaign because he set the pace in terms of policy. The, the Deeds campaign was constantly responding to whether or not they agreed with Bob McDonald's plan for transportation. Do they agree with Bob McDonald's plan for charter schools? Do they agree for Bob McDonald's plan for offshore oil and uh, gas exploration? Do they agree with Bob McDonald's plan for issuing Kindles to incoming freshmen uh, at, at University of Virginia and Virginia Tech and James Madison? Uh, instead of textbooks, let them download their books, and that will save parents about 250 bucks a semester. And, and he was constantly having to uh, say whether he agreed or disagreed with Bob McDonald's policies, which made it clear there's one person who's leading and one person who's following. That, that's terrific. But, but along the line of leading and following, you're one of the few people who can actually go back and look at 93, 94 because of all the work you did with Dick Army. Uh, and as we developed the contract with American, as we created the first majority in 40 years, how do you analyze this year and the environment and this cycle in comparison to what you lived through back then? Well, I think it's uh, a better environment. I, uh, my only concern is it's such a good environment so early. And, Speaker, you'll remember this. I, I remember going to the roll call of Capitol Hill newspaper with uh, Dick Army when he was chairman of the House Republican Conference, and you were the Republican uh, whip. And uh, in April of 1994, and he was asked by the, by the uh, roll call editorial board and reporters there how he felt about the elections in November, and he said he thought that we could win control of the House. And which would, as we know, take a 40 seat gain. And he was all but laughed out of the room. <laughs> that was not considered credible in April of 1994. And it was literally treated as like a joke. And he was, he was mocked for saying that. Of course, he said out loud what many of us who had been in many meetings, uh, uh, kind of thought. Um, so we were able to, uh, kind of sneak up on them to a certain extent. I don't think it was really until, I mean, even the contract with America unveiled on September 27 was mocked by Democrats. As, and it, it wasn't until, I, I, my sense is, you know, later even in October where they realized, boy, we are in trouble all of a sudden. Uh, and they realize it now. I don't know that they can change course um, if they want to. Uh, they may not be able to, but they have time to try to make some adjustments um, uh, to do that now. But I don't think they'll be able to. I suspect this wave just continues to build between now and November. What would you say, in that sense, what, what's your deepest advice to Republicans as they face this kind of a year, and, and given what you've learned over the last year from, from the McDonald campaign, what, what advice would you give candidates at every level? Because we're at American Solutions, we're trying to reach out from school board to city council to county commission to state legislature. It's, it's not just federal. Well, I think there are uh, really uh, a number of, of lessons that apply here from uh, Governor McDonald's campaign. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, be uh, uh, thoughtful and vigorous and fact-based in our critique of what the Democrats are putting forward in, in terms of their policies. I think that's what brought down the, their massive uh, health care, uh, proposed health care intervention, is that we were able to cite specifics about uh, the problems, the cost, and the impact on your personal insurance and on the deficit. And so that fact-based critique, I think, is very important. The American people are smart, and they will they will sort through those facts and figure it out for themselves, as opposed to just rhetoric. Uh, the second thing is to have a positive agenda of our own to point to and say, by the way, we're not just against that; we're for this, uh, and, and to point to the things that uh, that Republicans would do if we were to be entrusted with uh, with the majority again. And then the third thing I think has to do with uh, more with uh, tone uh, and style. And, uh, you know, uh, Governor McDonald uh, won a lot of independence and, and got the support of a lot of Democrats, frankly, uh, because he was not harsh or bitter or personal uh, in his rhetoric. He was uh, uplifting and positive. That's not to say we didn't have contrast on issues with, uh, with his opponent. He clearly did. Uh, his opponent was for higher taxes. Bob McDonald was for lower taxes. His opponent was for more regulation. Bob McDonald was for, for less regulation. There was nobody in Virginia who doubted that by, by the time November 3rd came around. But at the same time, uh, he was uh, someone who, when, when uh, President Obama came in to, to campaign for his opponent, 
and and uh, the media asked him, you know, what do you think of that? Uh, you know, President Obama's coming into into Virginia to campaign against you, and Bob McDonald said, the President of the United States is always welcome in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and if I'm you know fortunate enough to be elected governor, I'd welcome him back. People want that from their leaders. They they you know they they want to see people who are not. Uh, uh, harsh or mean or uh, personal or vitriolic. Uh, that's not to say they don't want to hear what your policies mean and how they're better than the other sides. Uh, but I think I think Governor McDonald's tone uh, went a long way in in uh, attracting those independent voters who uh, you know also saw that this is someone who is a principled conservative. Uh, on the issues, and and you know that's the ultimate combination. I think for a vast majority of voters is that that's where they are uh, for the most part on the issues. They are they are a center right electorate, and they're and they are drawn to the conservative principles, and they are drawn to uh, people who have a positive agenda and a positive uh, demeanor because that signifies to them leadership.